King of the Golden Hall. <clears throat> I'm not giving out the exam today because I don't know if we're going to finish. If we do finish, I'll email you the exam. Um, if we don't, then we'll finish on Tuesday and I'll email the exam then, which won't be due until uh, like a week December. and a half later or something like that. Okay, Because um, it will be take on and will be essay. So we're back in the chapter of the King of the Golden Hall. Gandalf has just gotten um, Theoden outside. Okay? And Gandalf tells him, Now, Lord, look out upon your land. Breathe the free air again. And Theoden stands there on this porch looking out over the land of Rowan. And we get this long description. From the porch upon the top of the high terrace, they could see beyond the stream the green fields of Rowan, fading into distant gray. Curtains of wind-blown rain were slanting down. The sky above and to the west was still dark with thunder, and lightning far away flickered among the tops of the hidden hills. But the wind had shifted to the north, and already the storm that had come out of the east was receding, rolling away southward to the sea. Suddenly, through a rent in the clouds behind them, a shaft of sun stabbed down. Falling showers gleamed like silver, and far away the river glittered, glittered like a shimmering glass. What's the significance of the shaft of sunlight from behind them stabbing down? It's a, it's a visual description of something that Tolkien talks about somewhere else. Is that the reflections of the truth of them? It, it is kind of partially that, especially because it, it shines down and it, you get the image of the river like a shimmering glass. Okay? But it's something else related kind of to that part. He has this notion of the truth of existence, the truth of God, the truth of the universe being as um, as an unbroken light mm -hmm. of which everyone, which everyone, of which everyone receives a small part. True. This is that image of joy from beyond the world stabbing them. <clears throat> This is a mini, if you want it, a visual eucatastrophe. This is not something you can expect to happen. Is it a, a great and sudden change? No. Is it a change? Yes. It had been dark before. Boom. Now the light shines down. Notice it comes down from behind them. It comes from their back. It's not something they turn around and look at and expect. It's completely, in other words, out of the blue to them. And what does it do? It enables Theoden to see. To see clearly. Or as Tolkien says in the essay, to see how he ought to see. It is not so dark here, Theoden says. This is the beginning of his illumination. No, said Gandalf. Nor does age lie so heavily on your shoulders as some would have you think. How old is Theoden? It says somewhere in the appendices. I don't remember the exact age. But he's not older than like 50. I'm, 50, I'm almost 51. He's, he's not that old. okay? And yet he's walking with a crutch, with a stick, not because he has an injured leg or anything. From the king's hand, the black staff fell clattering on the stones. He drew himself up slowly as a man that is stiff from long bending over some dull toil. Why has he been bending over? Why has he felt so old and darkened? He's been told he was for so long. He's allowed, he allowed himself to believe it. Allowed himself to believe it? He's been told this. Take two children. Start three years old. Put one in an environment that is entirely praising. I don't mean false praising. I don't mean, oh, Johnny, you're so wonderful, even though Johnny's dumber a brick, okay? I mean, 
when Johnny does things well, Johnny receives praise. And Sammy over here is told from day one on his third birthday, you're a lousy piece of you-know-what and you'll never amount to anything. Who's going to be successful? <laughs> this one is. This one is going to think he's a lousy piece of you-know-what and will never be successful and will probably become some kind of burden on society. Okay? Dark have been my dreams of late. But I feel as one new, awakened, recovered. I would now that you had come before. Yet when Gandalf did come before, what was he often called? Maybe not to his face, but to his back. Storm Gandalf Stormcrow, the bringer of bad news and ill tidings. Okay? <coughs> But now I fear you have come too late only to see the last days of my house. So he sees the light a little bit, but the light is tinged with darkness. He's like, you know, but we're on our way out. What's to be done? That what is to be done, it's almost a resigned question. Like, what can we do? Things are really bad. Gandalf, much. Much. It's his way of saying, don't give up. Okay? Sin first for Amir. <laughs> Am I not right? You got him in prison? Yes. You rebelled against my commands, threatened death to Grima. A man may love you and yet not love Wormtongue. Okay. So Grima is, uh, excuse me, Aomer is brought out. Gandalf says to him, to, excuse me, to uh, Thaden a couple pages later. When Thaden kind of tires, I mean, he's been standing up now for 20 minutes. <laughs> We're told, slowly Theoden sat down again, as if weariness still struggled to master him, against the will of Gandalf, like it's <coughs> Gandalf propping him up. He turned and looked at his great house. Alas, that these evil days should be mine. Frodo, why me? Why did the ring get rediscovered in our age? And should come in my old age instead of that peace which I have earned. Now what does he sound like? I shouldn't go there. <laughs> he sounds like he sounds like an old guy who says, "I'm owed. This is what the world owes me, merely because I'm old, because I've lived through so much." Okay. When he says that peace which I have earned, why has he earned it? What has he done to earn it? Alas for Boromir the brave. The young perish and the old linger withering. That is almost right out of, ba out of Beowulf. That, that line, partially at least, encapsulates what's called Hrothgar's homily from Beowulf. When Hrothgar, after Beowulf kills Grindel's mother, and he comes back carrying Grindel's head, and he comes back carrying the sword, he gives the sword hilt to Hrothgar. And Hrothgar looks at it, and the poet says, Hrothgar spoke. And then he looks at the hilt for about 17 lines, and the hilt has inscribed on it, you know, the stuff about the ancient strife of giants and all this kind of stuff. And then Hrothgar launches into this big, long speech. And it's almost always called either Hrothgar's homily or Hrothgar's sermon, because it is a sermon. The only thing he doesn't do is beat the Bible. Okay? And it is a sermon against pride. But one of the things he says in there is he talks about poor ways to die. And for a warrior society and for a warrior, the worst way to die is as an old man just withering away. Your, you know, like your strength is just kind of ebbing. 
the old, excuse me, the young perish and the old linger withering. And he clutches his knees with his wrinkled hands. Like, ah, I'm ready to get me a blanket, I'm cold. Gandalf, your fingers would remember their old strength better if they grasped a sword hilt. You know, put it in a modern context, your fingers would remember their strength better if you wrapped them around a clock. You'd feel good, okay? Theoden rises, there's no sword. Elmer offers his. And what does he do? He reaches out, he grabs the sword, and it seemed to the watchers that firmness and strength returned to his thin arm. Does that mean his arm is all thin and wasted? And he grabs the sword and cue the CGI, and it suddenly turns into Schwarzenegger arm? No. It means he discovers he's not a weak old man. And he lifts the blade, he swings it, he cries. And what has Gandalf done? Has he exorcised him? Well, if you want to, yeah, you could say. He exorcised what from him? Worm tongue? Doubt. Doubt. Another D word. Despair. See, this is really significant because we're going to see the parallel to this scene later on in The Return of the King. That parallel is when Gandalf meets with Denethor. But Denethor is already 100% full of despair. See, Theoden, there's still a glimmer of hope. That's why when Gandalf back at the Council of Elrond, it's either Gandalf or, El or Elrond, there's Gandalf, who said, you know, but a little bit of hope is not despair. And despair doesn't admit any possibility of hope. Okay? So, worm tongue is brought out, and what choice is he given? What, op what option, what opportunity is allowed him to regain his Lord's good graces? Prove himself in battle or get the hell out. Ride with me in battle. You say you love me. You say you serve me. Come with me. Or you can go wherever you want. If you want to go down to Sermans, go ahead. And that's exactly what he does. He turns, he spits it, Thaddeus in the face, and runs off. Okay? So what does Thaddeus decide he's going to do at that point? March to battle. So we have the Ents getting ready to march into battle. And now we have the men of Rowan getting ready to ride, not march, but ride into battle. Go on to the chapter 7, Helm's Deep. Now here's an interesting little tidbit. Helm's Deep is 16 pages long, okay, out of 1,031. 16 pages out of 1,031. The actual battle in Helm's Deep is nine pages. How long is the battle scene in the film? The second half of the movie. It's, if I remember correctly, because I timed it once, it was like agony. Um, I, it's something like 40 minutes, 45 minutes out of a two hour, two and a half hour movie. I mean, it's over a third, I think it is. I mean, it's, it's, or fourth, I mean. It's really long. And yet here it's not. I was at a conference in, um, what year is this? 2003. Um, in fact, it was the <coughs> anniversary of Tolkien's 111th birthday um, in Oxford. And 
one of the panels I was on was titled um, Does Tolkien Glorify War? Okay. And what spurred that panel was the first film. Or the second film. Maybe the second film was out by then. <clears throat> and I remember some of the other people talking and some of the questions that were being asked and stuff um, were all about, you know, well, you get the Battle of Helm's Deep and you get the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, you know. And I pointed out, you know, let's talk about those battles within the whole context of the novel. They're very short. Are they gruesome? Yes. Why? For the exact reason that Tolkien isn't glorifying war. He wants to show war as it truly is. So that when you see the heads of soldiers flying over the walls of Minas Tirith, Tolkien is showing bad things happen in war. When, when Frodo and Sam and Gollum cross the paths of the dead on their way to Mordor, and Frodo looks into pools of water and sees faces staring up at him. Okay. This is something that soldiers who survived World War I describe as happening to them. Not seeing the faces of people who died a thousand years earlier, but seeing the faces of friends and enemies whose heads had been blown off by cannon fire. And as they're crossing from one trench to another in the trench warfare, they come across disembodied heads floating in pools and puddles. Okay? So it's not some token just like, let's see, what can I come up with that's a really disgusting image that will you know, titillate the 17 to 24-year-old crap who does nothing but, you know, uh, more Mega Mutilation 27 on their Game Boy or whatever. It's not what he's doing. All right? What he wants to do is he wants to portray war in all of its ugliness. Because he experienced it. Go back to what he said in the foreword. By 1918, all but one of my closest friends were dead. Now, I, you know, that notion is hard for us to wrap our minds up. Even with 10 years of war in Afghanistan. Because what did we just celebrate the other day? The 2,000th dead. Our 2,000th soldier died in Afghanistan just last week. Okay? September, what day was it? September 17th or 18th, of this year was the sesquicentennial, the 150th anniversary of the bloodiest battle in American history, Antietam, Maryland. 6,000 dead. One battle. One. Okay? I mean, that was huge. Tolkien is just trying to get across. <laughs> War is kind of the last. Um, option okay so they're going to go off to helms deep and let's see here. they make their way we have the battle i'm going to skip the whole one you do have Legless and Gimli having their, you know, little competition. See who could kill the most orcs. Notice there is no dwarf tossing. Um, and Theoden and Aragorn and Aelmer ride out at the last moment. Why? What is their purpose of riding out on the moment or on the morning when we're going to see Gandalf, you know, Shining white rider, the cavalry, the whole nine yards. Why are they riding out? What do they think has happened? They think they've lost. But they're not going to die holed up in some caves. How are they going to die? 
They're warriors. This is like Butch and Sundance. They're going to go out in a blaze of glory. They're going to go out and they're going to be swallowed up by these thousands of orcs. That's what they're thinking. But they're going to take a bunch of them with them. But they go out and the orcs flee and such because of Gandalf and Eric and Brand and such. Okay? Go on to the road to Isengard. We're going to skip a bunch. Um, Gandalf tells them more about the Ents and such, and Theoden is like, Ents? This is page 549 and 550. Ents? Out of the shadows of legend, I begin a little to understand the marvel of the trees, I think. I have lived to see strange days. How many times have we heard almost that exact same sentence? We heard Elmer say it when he meets up with Aragorn the first time. We hear Aragorn essentially say it when Gandalf first tells him about Merry and Pippin being captured, saved, rescued, kidnapped, whatever, whatever term you want, by Treebeard. Now we hear Theoden say it. What do you think the message is, if there is one? How about all of our days are strange days? That is, every day, every life, every event can be the matter of mighty legend. It won't be us that will tell it. You know, let's use something very dull and prosaic. Well, kind of dull and prosaic. I'm teaching a um, freshman writing class, and much to their dismay, I'm forcing them to write a lot about politics um, this semester. I always do this whenever it's an election year. And so, you know, they had to watch the Republican and Democratic conventions. I mean, that gets them out of so many circles of hell once they die. <laughs> and then last night, I encouraged them. They didn't all, but I encouraged them, watch the debate. Okay. And we had class this morning. I left them in the hands of somebody else to do some library instruction. But I, I told them, I said, you know, if you watch that debate, prior to the debate, and I just saw the four polls this, this afternoon just before class, four polls came out before the debate that predicted or that showed that the majority of American people thought Obama was going to win that debate hands down. Like 59% of respondents thought Obama would win and 27 to 29% thought Romney would win. But everybody who watched it last night agrees. Romney won just hand over fist. I mean, he just bloodied Obama badly. Even Democrats. I mean, watch the little clip of Chris Matthews on MSNBC. I could swear, you know, they better pop up, you know, that heart attack medicine because he's about to have a massive coronary right there on live TV. Okay. Why do I bring that up? That is an event that will become legend. What do I mean? People are already saying on both left and right, which means this isn't a skewed idea. People are already saying Romney gave probably the best debate performance of any presidential candidate in the modern period. Now, that's going back to the kick, Nixon-Kennedy Nixon -Kennedy <laughs> debates. Okay. Lot are saying you got to go back to Reagan at the very least in the debate against Carter. Okay. That's legendary because there was only one debate that year and it was two days before the election. It was that one debate turned everything around, seemingly. Okay. Strange days. He doesn't know whether or not he can believe his eyes or his own senses. Long we have tended our beasts and our fields, built our houses, wrought our tools, or ridden away to help in the wars of Minas Tirith. What's that kind of sound like? Living here in little old America, 
long, we've taken care of ourselves, we've done our jobs, sometimes ridden off to war or sailed off to war to help our friends in Europe. And that we call the life of men, the way of the world. We cared little for what lay beyond the borders of our land. Now, when he says borders, I think Tolkien means borders in two <clears throat> senses of the word. I think he does mean literal, physical borders. Okay? You know, the kinds of things that divide <clears throat> USA <clears throat> and Canada. Okay? Or if you want, USA and Mexico. Right? Doesn't I pick your border? What's the other kind of border? He might mean between spiritual and physical. Yeah, or an intellectual border, not an actual physical thing, but an idea of borders, which is a demarcation point, a separation, a division line. We care little for what lay beyond the borders of our land. We care little for what lay beyond what has he been emphasizing in the previous lines. Things we see, we see, taste, touch, smell, our physical senses. And we don't care much for the other stuff. In other words, it's almost like Theoden is channeling J.K. Rowling. And he's saying, you know, we were good muggles completely oblivious to the magical world around. Songs we have that tell of these things. Songs. Why not histories, chronicles, newspapers? Because songs are fiction. They're make-believe. Okay? Fairy tales. They're not real. But we are forgetting them. Teaching them only to children. As a careless custom. This is the author of the fairy story essay saying, Open your eyes. Open your ears. Open your hearts to a wider, deeper, richer plane of experience. Don't think that only what is real is what you can see. Okay? And now the songs have come down among us out of strange places and walk visible under the sun. Visible under the sun. Creative fantasy is founded upon the hard recognition that things are so in the world as it appears under the sun. Upon a recognition of fact, not a slavery to it. Okay? So, by my emphasizing this and tying in the first story essay, am I saying that if you go out and you really open your eyes and you really open your ears and you walk into a fairy ring, you will whoop, go off into the other world? Might be awesome. Might Depending be awesome. on which of the fairy stories you read, otherwise it might not be so awesome. Okay? But like I said before, there are people in England who believe that 100% that if you see a ring of toadstools, you do not step inside it. No matter what. Sleeping okay? under a tree. That's still and people still do today. You know, Friday the 13th comes up. Black cat walks across their path. They won't walk underneath a ladder. Why? Oh, superstition. Well, if it's all only superstition, then they wouldn't care. That is, if it didn't mean anything whatsoever, they wouldn't care. The very fact that it does alter behavior means there's something up here in their minds that says, eh, just in case. <laughs> I'm going to hedge my bets. Okay? So, they keep making their way on. And let's see here. 
The horns pass them by in the middle of the night, and they make their way to Isengard. And they come to where the gates of Isengard stood, and they see sitting on a couple of slabs of stone these two other short individuals smoking. Welcome, my lords, to Isengard, page 556. We are the door wardens. Mary Addox, son of Saradoc, is my name and my companion. And he gives Pippin a dig with his foot. His peregrine son, a paladin of the house of Took. Far in the north is our home, where Saruman is within, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So, while the others go off, Legless, Aragorn, and Gimli sit around with Mary and Pippin, get food that they've pilfered out of the storehouse, and smoke some good weed. Pipe weed, that is. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> We're never exactly told exactly what kind of pipe weed, but we can assume it's tobacco. Um, and they tell Gandalf where Treebeard is. Okay? Chapter 9, Flotsam and Jetsam, I don't want to talk about much. Other than one real brief thing, bottom of 563, we get a date. It's kind of nice to have every now and then to keep us in track. It's the 5th of March. All right. Pippin, you know, starts doing some calculations, and he says, man, it's nine days ago. Seems a year since we were caught. Okay. So they explain what happened and such. When they were captured, how they escaped, how they met Treebeard. How Treebeard and the Ents came and wrought destruction on um, Isengard. Chapter 10, The Voice of Saruman. Gandalf comes with the others and says, I need to go talk to Saruman. And he says, um, I must pay Saruman a farewell visit. Danger is probably useless, eh, but it must be done. Those of you who wish may come with me, but beware. And do not jest. And he's probably looking at Pippin when he says that. <laughs> Don't be a smart aleck. Okay? Gimli, I will come. I wish to see him and learn if he really looks like you. <laughs> and how will you do that? If he wants to look like me, he will look like me to you. Are you yet wise enough to detect all his counterfeits? Well, we'll see. Who else? Pippin, well, what's the danger? Will he put a spell on us from a distance? Mm, probably that. Beware of his voice. And there's a, a really good BBC audio adaptation of The Lord of the Rings that was done in the mid-70s. And I don't know if you remember this actor, but the actor who did the voice of Sarah Man, I mean, he's just wonderful, was um, Ted Knight who played the role of Ted Baxter on the old Mary Tyler Moore show. You can probably find clips of it on YouTube, where he plays this bumbling newscaster who's completely narcissistic. Kind of like redundant, right? Um, but his voice is supposed to be like dripping with honey. Just totally seductive. Not in a sexual sense, but in a sense of, this guy would make the world's most fantastic car sell. He could sell you th something with no engine and no wheels, in other words. So they go down to the foot of Orthanc, and Gandalf says, I'm going up. The king says, I'm going up too, because I'm old and I'm about to die anyways. Why not? Aragorn, uh, Gandalf says, you're coming too. <laughs> Notice, Aragorn's like, I'm going to fight one too, you know. Aragorn's coming. You others stay down at the foot of the stairs. In other words, we have a king, a future king, and a supernatural being person thing. We're going to go up. Gimli, no, 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 Legolas and I, we're coming. We wish for a closer view. We represent our kindred. You go, fine, go ahead. You come then. And the riders of Rowan all stay down there, fine where they are. Mary and Pippin stay down there. So, Gandalf tells um, Wormtongue to fetch Saruman. 
And Sarah Mann comes out, and before he actually speaks, we get this long description of what he sounds like. Suddenly another voice spoke, low and melodious, its very sound and enchantment. Those who listened unwarily to that voice could seldom report the words that they heard. And if they did, they wondered for little power remained in them. Mostly, they remembered only that it was a delight to hear the voice speaking. All that it said seemed wise and reasonable. And desire awoke in them by swift agreement to seem wise themselves. When others spoke, they seemed harsh and uncouth by contrast. And if they gainsaid the voice, anger was kindled in their hearts, in the hearts of those who fell of those under the spell. For some, the spell lasted only while the voice spoke to them, and it spoke to another. They smiled as men do who see through a juggler's trick, while others gape at it. For many, the sound of the voice alone was enough to hold them enthralled. But for those whom it conquered, the spell endured when they were far away, and ever they heard that soft voice whispering and urging them. But none were unmoved. None rejected its pleas and its commands without an effort of mind and will, so long as its master had control of it. Well, who does the none include? Gandalf. That is, when Sir Man talks, man, he puts on 100% of the charm. And even Gandalf has to mentally tell himself, listen, don't listen, he's lying, stay in control. Well, why must you disturb me, I rest? Will you give me no peace at all by night or day? And they look up, and they see a kindly old man, whose face was long, with a beard, and Gimli, like and you don't like. It's like, he sees Sarah Man, he looks at Gandalf, goes, yeah, they look alike, and yet there's something that's different. So Sarah Man keeps speaking. He says, I know two of you, <laughs> Gandalf, I know you're not here for aid, but you, Theoden. And he addresses Theoden. We're going to see him directly address Theoden three times. Okay? Watch what happens with, three, which, with each of the three addresses. But you, Theoden, Lord of the Mark of Rowan, are declared by your noble devices. You know, the horse the hammer, and still more by the fair countenance of the house of Aeor. What is the fair countenance of the house of Aeor? You look like the other kings of Rwanda. Yeah, you look like a Norwegian. Dol or, you know, Dolph Lundgren, you know, you're tall, you're masculine, long flowing, you're a good Aryan, in other words, okay? O worthy son of Thingol, the thrice renowned, why have you not come before? And as a friend. Da -da 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 -da. I alone can aid you now. So he pours on the charm. Theoden opens his mouth as if to speak, doesn't say a thing. He looks up at Saruman, he looks at Gandalf. Gandalf doesn't do a thing. Why not? It's the Theoden can only can only be free of sorrow and he frees himself. Gandalf, you know, it's, it's like a child that is tempted by something. If a parent wants the child to overcome the temptation and learn, quote unquote, virtue, the child <coughs> has to do it on his or her own. You can't say to that child, no, 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 you can't have that. <laughs> Almost what you have to do is you have to put something out there. You just kind of go, Fuck. <laughs> you want that, don't you? Yes, precious, yes. You know, like the emperor, you know, telling Luke, you know, there's your, there's your, uh, whatever it is, lightsaber. Oh, and I'm unarmed. Oh, and you can strike me down. Wouldn't that be nice? Yes, I feel it. The hatred coursing within. Right? It goes back to Galadriel telling her she can't do it for him. She can't make those decisions. Exactly. So Gandalf doesn't do anything. The riders stir. They murmur with approval. 
There's a heavy silence. What does that heavy silence mean? Under control or there's huge doubt hanging in the balance. Finally, Gimli speaks. The words of this wizard stand on their heads. In the language of Orthanc, help means ruin. Saving means slaying. That is plain. We do not come here to beg. Now, this is written before 1984, which was published in 1948 or 49. Okay? But it's not published until 1954. Excuse me, 1950, yeah, late 1954. Okay? I don't know if Tolkien modified this passage to bring in Orwell's idea of doublespeak. But that's exactly what Gimli is talking about. Help means ruin, okay? Saving means slaying. War is peace. peace in 1984 in Oceania, okay? On the other hand, there's a lot, there's, or I've recently come across arguments that British propaganda in World War One is one of the most astounding rhetorical achievements in oh, yeah. memory and that no one who lived in England could be, could not, could be unaffected. Mind. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, war propaganda is an art form unto itself. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to London, you know, take in the World War II stuff. Visit, you know, go to Churchill's cabinet war rooms. Go to some of the other um, things, and I mean, the the propaganda is really just amazing. For a variety of reasons. Same with Hitler's, obviously. Sherman, peace! Okay. Why did I do it like that? And for a fleeting moment, his voice was less suave. I do not speak to you yet, Gimli Gloin son. Far away is your home, small concern of yours. I know you've been a valiant warrior, but let me speak with the king of Rowan, my neighbor and once my friend. And so he dresses Theoden again. Shall we take our counsels together against evil days? Repair our injuries? Shall our states both come to fairer flower than before? This is the second appeal. Notice Theoden is again silent. Now Aomer speaks. Lord, hear me. Now we feel the peril we were warned of. Notice. Gimli tries to answer for Theoden. Now Aomer tries to answer for his uncle. Have we ridden forth to victory only to stand at last amazed by an old liar with honey on his forked tongue? Kind of makes me think of, if you remember, the first Gulf War. No, take it back, not the first Gulf War. Spring of 2003, right after the, the more recent um, Iraq War, when the, uh, the Iraqi... Minister of, I was going to say Minister of Truth, uh, the uh, press secretary, Baghdad Bob, if you're familiar with them, what was he saying? We will, you know, have this glorious battle against the infidels, etc., as Baghdad is just getting the snot beat out of it. And the troops are turning tail the whole nine yards. What aid can he give to you? Okay. But none of that's really important. What really works is when Aylmer says, remember Theodred at the fords. Well, who is Theodred? Theoden's son. And what happened to him? In the grave of Hama in Helm's Deep, Theodred's body was hacked after he was dead into pieces, as was Hama at Helm's Deep. If we speak of poison tongues, what shall we say of yours, young serpent? But come, Aomer, Aomer's son. Notice he responds with a peak of anger, but then he, oh, I'm sure, man, got to put it in control. And then he speaks with that suave voice again. To every man his part, valor in arms is yours. You win high honor thereby. Slay whom your lord names as enemies, and be content. So in Sarah Man's mind, what is Aomer? Muscle. 
he's a weapon. That's what he is. He's a weapon. He's a spear. He's a sword. He's a dagger. He's a rifle. He's a pistol. Doesn't matter what kind of weapon. His job solely is to kill. Meddle not in policies which you do not understand. Maybe if you become a king, then you'll have to figure out, you have to choose your friends with care. The whole idea of now politic. Okay. The friendship of Saruman and the power of Orthanc cannot be lightly thrown aside. But my lord of Rowan, third appeal. Am I to be called a murderer because valiant men have fallen in battle? Notice what he's just done. He says, um, war dead. No. Am I to be called a murderer because men died in battle? He's just equated the death of soldiers in battle with murder. It's moral equivalency. Okay? It's saying all killing is murder. Keep that in mind. If you go to war needlessly, for I do not desire it, then men will be slain. But if I am a murderer on that account, then all the house of Errol is stained with murder. Why? Because the house of Errol has killed men in battle. For they have fought many wars and assailed many who defy them. Yet with some they have afterwards made peace, none the worse for being politic. I say, Thad and King, shall we have peace and friendship, you and I? It is ours to command. Okay? He is saying, because men have died in battle, at the hands of those under my command, you are saying, I am a murderer. Is that why Thadden or Eomer calls him a murderer? No. They don't mean you are a murderer because you launched people off into battle. They mean you are a murderer because your cause was not just. It was not a just war. Theoden finally answers for himself. We will have peace. And some of the writers whoop it up. You know, Yay, we can go home. Theoden holds up his hand. They shut up. Yes, we will have peace. We will have peace. Notice he says it three times. Once kind of for each appeal. When you and all your works have perished, and the works of your dark master to whom you would deliver us. You are a liar, Sarah man, excuse me, and a corrupter of men's hearts. You hold out your hand to me and I see but one finger of the claw of Mordor. Even if your war on me was just as it was not. Why was his war against Thanon not just? Well, first of all, it was it wasn't defensive. Who did he attack? Referred to by Aylmer at the forts. He says, remember Theodred at the forts. Who did he attack at the forts? It wasn't Aylmer. It was civilians. It was women and children. It was for Okay. Just... Just sent orcs over and set the whole damn thing on fire. Just sent orcs over to massacre. That's not good. <laughs> In just war, civilians can never be, never, okay, be the target. Can civilians be, quote unquote, collateral damage? Unfortunately, yes. Okay. Just war, you know, for example, in World War II, there were a couple of things that kind of, let's say, let's be charitable, 
really pushed the envelope on the just war um, theory behind the Allies in World War II. And I'm leaving, you know, the atomic bombs out of the picture for the moment. The firebombing of Dresden. Okay. Dresden wasn't really a military target. Dresden was a civilian target. The idea behind it was break the will of the Nazis. What my great, 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 great relative did in the South, the march on Atlanta and then to the sea, was to break the will of the South, even though Atlanta was a military target, okay? His weren't military targets. So, even if your war on me was just as it was not, and were you ten times as wise, you would have no right to rule me and mine for your profit. Even so, what will you say of your torches in Westfold and the children that lie dead there? And they hewed Hama's body before the gates of the Hornburg after he was dead. See, even in Tolkien's Middle Earth, there is something sacred about the body. We don't know what. The, the, for lack of a better phrase, religious thinking of the people of Middle Earth is never fleshed out for us. But there is something about the body that you don't massacre it or desecrate it after someone is dead. When you hang from a gibbet at your window for the sport of your own crows, I will have peace with you and Lord Thane. So much for the house of Aero. Lesser well, son of great sires am I, but I do not need to lick your fingers. I fear your voice has lost its charm. And the men of the writers of are like, oh crap, that we're going to be fighting this battle for years. But Sarah Man just completely loses it. I mean, just all composure out the window. Gibbets and crows? Don't turn! Ah, oh, now he's going to tell us what he really thinks of the House of Errol. What is the House of Errol but a thatched barn where brigands drink in the reek? Okay, that's an accurate description of Aderas or Meduseld. Okay, Meduseld, it's one word, it's an old English coinage, it means meat hall. Okay. Theoden, his name, is Old English for king. So when he's referred to as Theoden king, that means king king. Okay? But in Anglo-Saxon, Mead Hall was for all intents and purposes a barn thatched with straw and hay, okay, where they would bring the animals in during the winter or sometimes during the night. And they would sleep in part of it. There would be thatch or straw and stuff on the ground, okay? Just a big old fire pit in the middle, a hole in the roof, and the smoke would come up, and it would bellow out to the sides, and, you know, people would have trouble breathing. Okay. Too long have they escaped the gibbet themselves. Go back to your huts. But you, Gandalf, old buddy, old friend, he goes on. And Gandalf's like, huh, what? And so Saruman now puts everything into his address to Gandalf. He said, I, I don't understand how you can hang around with these low likes. But you and I, our friendship would profit us. Much we could still accomplish together. Will you not consult with me? Will you not come up? And we're told, so great was the power that Saruman exerted in this last effort, none stood within hearing were unmoved. Now the spell is wholly different. And they, that is, those who are not Gandalf, know they're on the outside. What are we told? Many of them think, he's going up. We're screwed. We're lost. He will be us. Theoden even thinks. And Gandalf laughs. And says, Sarah, man, you missed your path in life. You should have been the king's jester and earned your bread and stripes too by mimicking his counselors. What does he mean by stripes? Jester stripes. Okay. Motley. I fear I am beyond your comprehension. But you, I understand, 
now too well. He goes, will I come up? No, I don't think so. But why don't you come down? Why does Gandalf ask him to come down? What does he offer him? Free choice to repent. Free choice to repent. Turn from your ways. Would it not be well to leave it for a while, to turn to new things? The shadow passes over the Sarah man's face, then it goes deathly white. He says, why come down? No, of course I won't. I know where the wild wood demons are lurking at your command. That is the tree beard and the other ends. Gandalf, man, the treacherous are ever distrustful. Those who don't trust never are given trust. But you need not fear for your skin. I do not wish to kill you or hurt you, as you would know, if you really understood me. And I have the power to protect you. I am giving you a last chance. This is, you know, Harry Potter saying to Lord Voldemort, be a man, feel remorse. I've seen the real you. Gandalf is saying, you can become useful. Sarah Man, okay, what are the conditions? Gandalf, okay, you come down, you give me your staff, you give me the keys to order thing. If you prove yourself, they might be returning sometime in the future. Say Sarah You can't believe Gandalf. So he turns and he stumps off and goes back into the tower. Come back, Sarah Man. And he turns and he like he's being pulled back. I did not give you leave to go. I have not finished. What does Sarah Man realize at this point? Yikes. Yeah. Gandalf is now more powerful than he is. He was never able to do that before. Yes. Is that because he is, when they, the Galadriel and the Sarmor Sar always talk about where they point the leader, is that when he gets overpowered with Gandalf? Is it when he's a No, I don't think it has anything to do with Galadriel. I think it has everything. No, I, mean, I think it has everything to do with when he wandered outside time and thought. Part of the factory refit. Yeah. <laughs> Let me put it this way. When he tells Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli, I am Saruman as he should have been. Well, okay. Saruman, I'm asking how is Saruman at first supposedly more powerful than Gandalf? Oh, that we don't have, we don't know. We, we just know, I mean, Gandalf says he's the head of our order. Yes. That means he is the head of the order of Istari. The group of wizards, there are five of them, who came from the west that is Valinor, back in the first age, entered Middle Earth. Okay. Nobody really knows who or what they were. That is, in Middle Earth, I don't think Aragorn, for example, knows that Gandalf is a Maya. I don't think he has any inkling about it. Tom Bombadil, probably yes. Galadriel, Elrond, probably yes. Okay, But not Aragorn. So, you have five of these, and we're told we're just told Saruman is the head of the order. We don't know if that's because Manwe says, "Okay, I'm going to send you five, and Saruman, you're going to be in the top." It, it, that's never explained. But when Gandalf says, "I am Saruman as he should have been," I think that what Tolkien is suggesting there is that the the Istari are not meant to be static. They're meant to be dynamic. They're meant to kind of grow into their position, in, into their jobs, as it were, or into their true natures. And Gandalf is saying, I have risen up from being gray. Okay? You have Radagast the Brown, who's beneath. There's one that's blue. He's never named. Uh, there's the white. And there's one other one, I don't know, probably green or red, down to two blues. Are there two blues? Yeah. Okay. Somewhere down here. And what Gandalf, I think, is saying is, what happened when he, quote, unquote, died? He was purified. So he goes to be even purer, because what has Sarah Man done with his white? He's off white. He's broken it. He's broken it. 
He's broken it. So he's now, yeah, off white. <laughs> he's dingy white, as it were, okay? Whereas Gandalf is pure white, as he's going to tell us. Behold, I'm not Gandalf the Grey and the Betrayed. I'm Gandalf the White, who has returned from death. He makes it clear here that what he talked about earlier was, I died, and I'm back again. As far as we know, I've not read all of the 12-volume history of Middle-earth, but I don't think there is anything in there. As far as we know, this is the only time that happens. It's a pretty big eucatastrophe. Okay? And what caused it? Pippin dropping the rock into the well. Okay? And the second time he tells somebody, I died and I don't have to take this from you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm Gandalf the Wide, who has returned from death. You have no color now. I cast you from the order and from the council. Now, this tells us Gandalf suddenly has some other kind of power. Because now he says you're no longer one of these. You are no longer a wizard. So if Sir Man had his own staff, you know, think of the films with the cool little crystal at the top that, you know, could shine light and bzz, do laser kind of stuff. His staff no longer does that. He could take it and point at people, even though Gandalf's going to break it in a minute. But when Gandalf says you have no color now, that means his staff goes limp. It's, it's now like a you know, celery stalk. It just, he doesn't have a light. He can't perform any, what Sam would call, magic. Does he still have power? Yes, in his voice. Especially over those of somewhat weak minds. You know, like a Jedi. Right? Um, so... Grima throws something out, which Pippin goes and picks up. And top of 585. Pippin asks Gandalf, what if Sauron does not conquer? That is, what, what if we win? What will you do to him? That is, to Saruman. Right? Notice what Pippin's question is assuming. What does Gandalf have over Saruman? Power. He has control. What are you going to do to him, Gandalf? Huh? You going to put him on the rack? You going to throw him in the tower of London? Not poor thing. Gandalf, I nothing. I will do nothing to him. I do not wish for mastery. Remember the other day when I talked about the difference in the fairy story essay between magic and enchantment? Gandalf is saying, "I am not a magician." I am not a sorcerer. I do not seek control. What does he seek? Sheared enrichment. Gandalf is a, um, back when my dad was, was doing a human, I can't even remember the name of the department, like human resources stuff. He was doing training and such. There's a big buzzword in corporations calling people enablers. It's such a blech, namby pamby. Well, I mean, that's <laughs> my kind of enabler. Enablers. They are people who enable you to reach your goals, to reach your potential, to dig deep and find what you're really good at and everything. Kind of like today, you know. New term, it's also used for it, coaches. Some people think of professors like this. I think that's completely and utterly asinine, but I think we're dictators, frankly. Okay? Enablers. Is Gandalf really an enabler? No. But he doesn't want control. What will become of him? I don't know. I grieve that so much that was good now festers in the tower. He's telling us, Sarah Man was once really good. And now he's just getting more and more and more foul. Okay? So they leave. We get to chapter of the Palantir, which we're going to go through real, real quickly. Ever since Pippin picked up that little ball, his fingers have been itchy. So what does he do that night? 
He puts a rock in Gandalf's arms. He takes a pounder. He looks at it. What does he say? Sauron. The Dark Lord himself. And what does Sauron think? That he's the ring bearer. And that Saruman has him. Okay? So Pippin tells Gandalf everything. And Gandalf says at the bottom of 593... You've taken no harm. There is no lie in your eyes, as I feared, but he did not speak long with you. A fool, but an honest fool you remain. You're an idiot, but at least you're a sincere idiot, Peregrine Truck. Another might have done worse in such a pass, or wiser ones might have done worse. But mark this, you have been saved. Saved. And all your friends, too. Mainly by good fortune. Look at the next clause. As it is called. Why does Gandalf say that? Notice what the, the, what kind of voice is that? As it is called. It's passive. So who does the calling of it? People in of that? People like Ellen. Only they experience like Pippin's experience, Pippin's the physical. Okay. Do you think Gandalf is one of those who calls it good fortune? No. No, because I think Gandalf has a better understanding of the working of the world. Think of that whole Boethian idea that I put up that one day. If he questioned you then and there, you almost certainly would have spilled the beans and the game would be up. But he didn't. That's another you catastrophe. He didn't press his case when he had the chance. Okay. So Gandalf gives the Palantir to Aragorn. Why? It's his. His great, 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 you know, grandpappy made it. So it belongs to you. And then he tells him, but don't be hasty. <laughs> don't rush into using it. And Aragorn's kind of like, come on, Gandalf. When have I ever, you know, been rash? So, Gandalf and Pippin hop onto Shadowfax, and they leave. Remember the other day I did Legless, Aragorn, Gimli. Now we have Gandalf, Pippin. We have Mary, Frodo, excuse me, sorry, Sam, Frodo. We still have um, Mary here, okay, and Boromir is like generally small Francisco Franco is still dead. Okay? Sorry, it's a Saturday Night Live joke from the 70s. So we have Legolas, Aragorn, Gimli, Mary, with the Riders of Rowan, temporary at least. Gandalf and Pippin, they're going off to Minas Tirith. Sam and Frodo marching into the, you know, bowels of hell itself. Uh, they're going off into Mordor, and he is, who knows? So, book four, Taming of Smeagol, with 15 minutes to go. So we have them off on their own, them off on their own, and Tolkien takes us all the way back to Sam and Frodo Wynn. Right after they left. Yeah, almost right after they left. So they make their way into the Emin Mule, and they see Gollum behind them, and they hear him, and they capture him. Sam jumps him, Gollum bites him, etc. And Sam asks, bottom of 614, what's to be done with it? Notice, it, not him, it. Tie it up so as it can't come sneaking after us. Go, but that would kill the go. Cruel little hobbitses. Frodo, no, if we're gonna kill him, we have to kill him outright. Poor wretch. He's done us no harm. Sam's, you know, shoulders bloody, bleeding from where Gollum bit him. Like he hasn't. He meant to. Did he mean to do them harm? Yes. He'd have throttled them if he had the chance. Frodo, but what he means to do is another matter. In other words, 
This isn't like minority reports where you can get thrown in jail because of what you're thinking of doing. As Frodo suddenly remembers, he hears that conversation from what seems like years and years ago when it's only about nine months ago. A pity Bilbo did not stab the vile creature when he had a chance. Pity? It was pity that stayed his hand. Pity and mercy, not to strike without need. I do not feel the pity for Gollum. He deserves death. Deserves death? I dare say he does. Many that live deserve death, and some die that deserve life. Can you give that to them? Be not too eager to deal out death in the name of justice. Fearing for your own safety. Even the wise cannot see all ends. And what does Frodo do? For now that I see him, I do pity him. Why else does Frodo pity him? And seeing him is one reason. It's the major reason. Because he understands what. How? Because he's the ring bearer. He's been carrying the ring a long time now since he's known what it does. He's carried the ring, he's put it on, he's seen the Black Riders, he's seen the Eye of Mordor. He's experienced an inkling of what Gollum has experienced. And kind of like, wow, and you're still alive. This guy's tough. So, how does Frodo get Gollum under control, Paul? Uh, well, just what he says later on also, Frodo really needs to believe that owning the ring doesn't permanently screw you up. Yeah. <laughs> Because, you know, he, he knows who owns the ring at this moment. Okay? So how does he tame Gollum? Or Smeagol? Smeagol asks to swear by the precious. Gaul and Frodo says, swear? And he drew himself up to all, you know, three feet, five inches. And says, on the precious, how dare you? One ring to rule them all. One ring and in the darkness bind them, etc. Right. Frodo says, no, I'm not going to let you swear on it. You wish to see it and touch it if you can, though you know it will drive you crazy. No, you can swear by it. And so what does Gollum swear? We promise yes, I promise. Not we, I. I will serve the master of the precious. Good master, good smeagol. This is where Frodo should have taken a course in contract negotiation. Because what does he not do? He doesn't define terms. He should have gone, say. We promise this, yes, I promise, I promise. I will serve the master, also known as Frodo Baggins, heir of Bilbo Baggins, of Bag End, Bagshot Road, the Shire, the West of Middle Earth, such and such a time frame, Arda, the world of the precious. He doesn't specify who the master is, which is why Gollum can immediately start to plan. And if I becomes the master, then I can serve myself. All right? So Gollum takes them on the passage through the marshes. We're going to skip a bunch again. Um, page 625. About two-thirds of the way down on the page in the one-volume edition, we get this little break, and we're told the hobbits were now wholly in the hands of Gollum. Next paragraph. Frodo asks Gollum, How do we shape our course now, Smeagol? Must we cross these stinking or these evil-smelling fins? The passage that I think is important there is, How do we shape our course now? Now, what is he saying? How do we make our destiny? He notice he doesn't say what path do we follow. He's saying, how do we make our path? Why? How many of us follow a path that's already been laid out? None of us. None of us, none of us do exactly what somebody else has done. 
We might, you know, be in the general area, but the decisions are different. The ramifications and consequences are unique to us. Okay? That's why, you know, you, you get politics again. You get, you know, President Obama and you get Mitt Romney, and they're getting just tons of advice from people via the Internet. All these pundits who think they know everything, notice none of them have ever run for president. None of them have ever been elected president. You know, one of the biggest Democratic consultants, a guy named Bob Shrum, he's run something like eight presidential campaigns. They all lost. Yeah. Why in the world would you take advice from this idiot? Okay? Or, you know, John McCain's old campaign advisor. One of the worst run campaigns in the history of America. Okay? How do we shape our course? Autumn? It's kind of remember. Hobbit, when the dog tells the dwarves to stay on the path, and they don't stay on the path. And they don't stay on the path. Well, this is significant because we're going to hear, not today, unfortunately, we're going to hear Frodo and Sam when they come to the Tower of Kirith Ungol, and they start to make their way up. They start to talk about stories and how our path is laid, okay? Which is why I wanted to bring this up. We might actually get to it, because we're going to skip a bunch now. Um, they go through the paths of the dead. Gollum tells them about, you know, the battle that was fought here before. This is the area that Elrond was talking about when he says, I remember the armies of Elendil and Gilgalad when they fought at the Plain of Daggerland. This is the Plain of Daggerland. Okay? Um, they get before the Black Gate. Sam overhears Gollum's conversation with Smeagol, where Smeagol, notice, wants to be nice to Mr. Frodo, and Gollum's like, yes, but if we were the master, <laughs> you know, then we can protect it, we can. We hear or see the black gate is closed, and Gollum says, you know, you asked me to take you. This is it. You didn't ask me if there's any other. Is there another? Yes, there is another way. Is it guarded? Maybe. <laughs> so they keep going. And page 644. A couple pages before the end of the chapter. Sam and Frodo are thinking about what option Gollum has given them. And Sam, uh, Frodo sits down, thinks for a long while, striving to recall all that Gandalf had said to him. But Gandalf's, you know, dead. Everybody else is far away. And here he is thinking. Here he was, a little halfling from the Shire, a simple hobbit of the quiet countryside, expected to find a way where the great ones could not go or dared not go. It was an evil fate. Fate, not shaping our path where we may go. When Frodo sits down and thinks this is an evil fate, what does that suggest is going on in his mind? I'm screwed. I am totally screwed. I cannot win this. It's like Oedipus, okay? But he had taken it on himself in his own sitting room in the far off spring of another year. What was that far off spring? It was last year. So remote now that it was like a chapter in a story of the world's youth. Almost like it was a legend. Notice how this emphasis on stories coming to life just keeps coming up. When the trees of silver and gold were still in bloom, this was an evil choice. This, the choice he now has to make. Follow Gollum? Which way should he choose? If both led to terror and death, what good lay in choice? In other words, if he could choose to go to the Black Gates or march south and go another way that is equally guarded, why? I mean, you just get tired, hungry, dirty, and thirsty going this way. If you're going to die, why not just die right here? No. 
20th, 21st century mindset said, well, duh. <laughs> but a Anglo-Saxon mindset, which is what the tales are written from, says, no, where there's breath and life, there's spirit. You fight on. You fight to the end. You never give up. And, you know, cue the Winston Churchill, we shall fight them from the beaches, we shall fight from the that great speech. Okay? So, they march south. And they march south, and they come to the land of Athelion, and Sam realizes Mr. Frodo's getting thin, so he's going to fatten him up by cooking a stew of herbs and rabbit. But because he makes a fire, they get captured. And as they are making their way back to the place where the men of Athelion, the rangers of Athelion, have as their hideout, they get ambushed. This is just second to the last page or so of the chapter of, of herbs and stewed rabbit. And Sam's, you know, in one sense he's really happy because he's seen an olifant, an elephant, great big huge thing. But then he actually witnesses battle of men. And we get this beautiful passage in a sense. Sam, bottom of 660, eager to see more, went now and joined the guards. He scrambled a little way up into one of the larger of the bay trees. From, in other words, he wants to see fighting. For a moment he caught a glimpse of swarthy men in red running down the slope, some way off with green-clad warriors leaping after them. Arrows stuck in the air. Suddenly, straight over the rim of their sheltering bank, a man fell, crashing through the slender trees, nearly on top of them. He came to rest in the fern a few feet away, face downward, green arrow feathers sticking from his neck below a golden collar. The arrow's gone through his neck. Scarlet robes were tattered, his corslet of overlapping brazen plates, rent and hewn. Black plates of hair braided with gold were drenched with blood. What does he look like? An American Indian, black hair, red skin, hairs plated, okay, brown hands still clutched the hilt of a broken sword. It was Sam's first view of a battle of men against men, and he did not like it much. It's so important that it's one person, it's one individual that he sees. It's not a mass. And notice why is Sam even there? He wanted to be. He wanted to see a human battle, a battle of men against men. He was glad that he could not see the dead face. He wondered what the man's name was and where he came from. And if he was really evil of heart, what is Sam doing? He's making the, the dead person a person. He's humanizing him. Whereas before he saw like Frodo did with Gollum earlier, just an enemy. He deserves death. Now Sam starts to wonder, this, was this guy married? Did he have a family? Was he evil of heart? Or was he just following orders? What lies or threats had led him on the long march from his home? And if he would not really rather have stayed there in peace, all in a flash of thought, You've all heard the stories, probably, about some of the things that went on in World War I. One Christmas Eve, I think it was 1917, somewhere in the fields of France, there was a ceasefire. English started singing Christmas carols, and the Germans started singing Christmas carols. This, is, this actually happened. It's not fantasy make-believe. And they got up out of their trenches Christmas Eve and went across and exchanged bits of chocolate and coffee and fat cigarettes and sang Christmas carols together. And then they went back, and the next day, they started shooting and shelling each other. Okay? What does that mean? It means these guys realize in the midst of battle, you know, if it weren't for our leaders, we probably wouldn't be here, okay? 
All right, we'll stop there. Okay, we've got to finish on Tuesday. Have to. Just absolutely have to. Which we can because we'll actually zip fairly fast through the return of the game. A lot of it can be skipped. The whole fields of Cormallon and all the horrible poetry. So will we do all of the scripture letters on Thursday then? Is that the text? Thursday, um, uh, I don't know. We'll see. No, we won't do all of screw taking on that. Okay, I think. I want to make sure I understood what you're suggesting for the exam. Um, is it at all possible that we will distribute that on Tuesday? For